to turn on this computer. Okay, great. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Obo Li. Uh, I'm a postdoc at UNC. Uh, so I have been working on machine learning for more than three years. And uh, uh, here is just a series of machine learning lectures that I designed. Uh, so this lecture falls under the Par German Dark uh, lecture series, and today we will go through the first lecture, which is the basics of machine learning. Uh, so here is an overview of the lecture. So this course is called the practical machine learning. So the goal is to introduce different aspects of machine learning in a practical math free manners. So there are several ways of teaching machine learning. I mean, you can carefully derive every single equation and do like a 10 page derivation. But I feel like that's actually not what we will actually need. So I decided to do it in a more practical math free way. So the goal, so this course, uh, also this course will focus on the deep learn, deep neural network models. So there are other machine learning models, for example, boosted decision tree, support vector machine or some clustering map algorithm. I do not have time to go through them. So uh, you can also call this course a practical deep learning and that, that's, that's okay. Um, after this course, uh, you will be able to gain the ability to design and deploy fundamental machine learning models uh, uh, for images and waveforms data. And you will also have some basic understanding of advanced machine learning models and the development trend of machine learning community. So I structured this course uh, with five models. So the first module, as we will go through today, is the basics of machine learning. So the second module, we are going to talk about convolutional neural network for image data. And the third module and fourth module are both going to be time series, because most of us are on germanium detector, which produce a waveform, and waveform is a time series. I decided to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, and the last module will kind of be an expanded uh, project where we talk about a lot of the advanced machine learning models. So uh, we will do this lecture on uh, Friday, 10, 10 a.m. EST, the same time every week. So this will be the first one. And then we do the second module next Friday and so on until we go through all the five modules. Uh, so uh, this course is, of course, sponsored by the Pyre Germany project, as most of you have already known. So I would like to give special thanks to NERSC for providing the query access and also the GPU resources for completing the homework. So here is a training code um, for this uh, for, for this project, which is a uh, small case B capital W capital J small case A. So please uh, write it down uh, or, 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 call, or kind of, you know, record it down somewhere where you are convenient because uh, when I upload this slide, I will delete this uh, bullet point actually. Uh, so this course also operate under the scope of Germanium Machine Learning Group. So Germanium Machine Learning Group is a group that provide artificial intelligence support uh, to Madrona Demonstrator, Gerda, and Legend uh, collaboration. So if you are interested in doing a machine learning project uh, and you belong to one of these three collaborations, please uh, send me an email and we can actually uh, find a project for you to, uh, to help the development of AI on Germanium detectors. Uh, so this course is partially based on this book called Deep Learning by Ian Goodfellow, uh, Joshua Benigno, and uh, Aaron Corwell. So um, those three people are just, they are all big names uh, in the machine learning community. And this book, uh, which sometimes is called a, like a flower book, is also kind of often referred to as the Bible of deep learning. Uh, so I think this book worth like a thousand dollars and I get it for like 50 bucks. <laughs> so I strongly recommend uh, everyone to buy it if you are interested in machine learning. Uh, and lastly, there will be four Jupyter notebook homework associated with this course. Uh, and uh, the idea is we have one homework per module, except the last one. Okay, so before we start lecturing, I would actually like to ask you a question. So what do you think machine learning is? So fill in the blank. Machine learning is blank. Uh, and I will actually launch the poll. Uh, so please uh, try to vote and give me your opinion. So what do you think machine learning is?
Okay, I will wait for maybe 10 more, 10 more seconds. Okay, great. Now we have everyone voted. Uh, I can already see the I can already see the distribution. So actually, most more than half of the people think machine learning is statistics. Uh, about the second place, uh, the second best vote is computer science, about twenty three percent, and the third uh, of the, the third highest uh, uh, proportion is mathematics. About eighteen percent people people think is mathematics, and only uh, about five percent of people think it's physics. Okay, uh, now let's uh, let's go through the uh, go through each of them. Actually, every one of you is correct in my in my opinion. So uh, machine learning is computer science because the boom of artificial intelligence is not possible, or in other words, not really worth it without the era of big data. So on the right, I show the plot of how the data has been greatly um, increasing uh, the amount of data we have. So the overwhelming amount of incoming data makes a traditional method nearly impossible because in traditional method, usually we go through each of the data and we find some kind of uh, rules or principles to do our to do our analysis. Uh, and on the other side, um, the ease of storing and accessing data, especially on the cloud, makes learning from data a better choice than learning from programmers. And lastly, we the fast development of computer hardware such as a uh, graphical neural uh, uh, GPU, a graphical card, and the tensor and the tensor card TPU, greatly facilitates the development of machine learning models. Machine learning is also math. Uh, so the backbone of machine learning, which is called the back propagation equation, is actually uh, uh, is actually a theoretical backbone for all the neural network models. Without that, it's not possible to train a machine learning model. And also linear algebra plays a very, very important role in machine learning algorithms because machine learning is matrix multiplication. Uh, you will see this sentence more and more um, as we go through the lectures. And also there are many subcategories of math uh, which is responsible for machine learning model design. For example, we can use group theory and topology to design a geometric deep learning model or we can use a graph theory to design what we call a graphical neural network. So as what most of you have been saying that machine learning is statistics and I totally agree with you. Uh, so neural network is oftentimes considered as a universal function approximator. We, we will talk about what this is um, in, in, the, in a few slides. Uh, the, most, uh, the most common usage of neural network is to, appro is to approximate some function and the most common use is to use it to approximate some kind of probability density function. Um, and also you can view machine learning in terms of both the frequentist scope and the Bayesian scope. So for example, in frequentist scope, you can do a maximum likelihood estimation using machine learning. And also the negative log likelihood fit we usually perform is actually kind of connected to the cross entropy loss we often use in a machine learning classification model. And also on the Bayesian side, you can do something called a maximum a posteriori um, estimation, which is actually the Bayesian version of the maximum likelihood. And also there is something called a Bayesian neural network and variational autoencoder, which both uses um, the concept of Bayesian of the base equation. Lastly, machine learning is physics, really? So um, there are actually some link between machine learning and physics. Uh, for example, uh, machine learning uses a uh, um, loss function called cross entropy, uh, which is actually derived from the entro information entropy. And the entro information entropy is actually the, and the thermal entropy we learn in statistical mechanics is actually the two sides of the same coin. And also, uh, I have heard a very interesting seminar where they talk about the optimization of a neural network is, is actually identical to the renormalization group flow um, in quantum field theory. So uh, if you are interested in this, I recommend to you to read something called the restricted Boltzmann machine. And also there are also something called the Lagrangian deep learning, which to be honest, I don't know too much, but I know theorists really like to use that to solve their problems. Uh, so I hope with this question and some of my explanation, um, I will give you a sense that machine learning is really not uh, just like one subcategory of something. It's kind of like a multidisciplinary, um, uh, like a collaborative effort among different parts. So machine learning is computer science when you are training and applying the model. It is math and statistics when you design model. 
and it ha also has some kind of subtle link to physics. So back in 1959, Sir Samuel Arthur described machine learning as the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So uh, if I were to re reiterate uh, Sir Samuel Arthur's word, I would say machine learning is learning from data instead of learning from the program. So you all see this uh, sentence learning from data appear many times uh, in, my, in my slide because this is kind of my personal motto for what machine learning is. Okay, so let's give a little bit more a thorough definition of machine learning. Uh, so Professor Tom Mitchell uh, defined machine learning uh, using a little bit more thorough definition. So he said machine learning is a, co a computer program is set to learn from experience E with respect to some task T as some performance measure P if the performance T as measured by P improve by experiments experience E. So you see we have this uh, kind of a trinity of machine learning, which is task, experiments, and performance. I will explain each of them uh, uh, on, on, this, on this plot. So for example, first task, what do you want to do with your machine learning model? For example, you can use it to classify, um, you can use it to classify different classes, uh, classify some input events into different classes. You can also do regression, like a linear regression, quadratic regression. Uh, you can uh, ask a machine to cluster your event into different kinds of clusters, or you can even ask your machine to generate some field, so some fake data that's reminiscent of um, what it looks like in the real world. So this is a different kind of task that the machine learning model can do. Uh, and the experience we are talking about is basically the data we are using to train the machine. And for the data, uh, we usually split them into a train data set, a training data set, and a test data set. And it usually contains the form of input vector x and the label y, which tells uh, what the data actually is. And lastly, we want we have a performance measure, which is uh, uh, we want to we want to use this performance measure to optimize our model to bestly achieve our task. Uh, so this is uh, actually accomplished by optimizing a loss function. And we can also use some validation metrics to test it on the actual, on the actual model, uh, on the actual uh, kind of performance that we would like it to, uh, we would like it to uh, perform. Okay, so uh, in order to give you an exa example about how we are defining a machine learning model, I would actually like to revisit uh, what most of us have been very familiar with, which is uh, linear regression. So linear regression can actually be reformulated as a machine learning algorithm. So um, as we know, the task of a linear regression is of course, uh, is of course a, a regression task. And uh, I, here I actually kind of reformulate the problem of linear regression where I'm saying for each, uh, for the input of each point X, I would like to predict what, it, what is its Y position using like a line. So this is basically uh, the same as a linear regression. And so in this model, we have Y hat, which is a prediction of Y uh, equals to a weight matrix uh, T with respect to X. And this weight matrix is updated during the machine learning progress to best fit our purpose. So the experience, of course, here are the data points, as we mentioned. So the input is the x axis of each of our points, and the label is a y axis uh, of each of the points. Uh, so uh, the train, and also we split them into the training data, which is the red dots, and the validation data, which is a, uh, which is a, uh, well, I don't know, <laughs> yellow greenish dots. And what we do is that, and then we use a performance measure to train our machine to do our purpose, which is to uh, fit uh, all those data points uh, to the best extent. So what we do is that we minimize the difference between each labeled Y uh, and the machine output Y hat. And we use what we call the mean square error loss, which is just Y hat minus Y square. And you sum over them and you divide it by the amount of points you had. So this is, basically identical to what you do in a linear regression problem. And you can see here, uh, if, after I reformulate it in a machine learning sense, uh, you, you can see it's still doing its job by fitting into all the points. So the optimization 
of this machine learning model is actually performed using what we call the gradient descent method. Uh, and I will talk about that in my later slides. Okay, so um, after having the model, um, I would like to talk about what we, what we call the overfitting and underfitting. So this is the same problem where we perform a linear regression given X and we are predicting what is Y hats. And you can see uh, in the first case, if we are using a 1D polynomial to approach, uh, to approach this problem, to, to fit this, uh, to fit this uh, uh, scatter points, uh, you can see that it doesn't actually describe the trend of the data very well because the model is too simple. So in this case, we call it uh, underfitting. Our model is not complicated enough to handle the structure within the data. And if uh, on, on, the, on plot B, if you use a second order polynomial to fit uh, this data set, and now you can see uh, in your prediction, which is the red point, the distance between your prediction on the curve and your actual, um, your actual out of sample data is actually pretty small, much smaller than the underfitting case. Uh, but there is another possibility. Uh, so if your model has too many parameters, for example, it's like a, a hundred order polynomial, then your model is remembering each very little wiggle in your data set, as you can see on these plots. And it doesn't actually generalize well uh, for uh, out of sample data, for example, this red points. If you compare uh, the overfitting distance from the uh, out of sample data point to the curve and the good fit distance from the out of sample data, um, data set and the curve, you can see this one is actually much larger. So that means your model doesn't generalize, uh, your model is remembering too much detail in your training data set and it doesn't uh, recognize the uh, actual feature of your test data set well. So that's why we would like to split our data set into a training and a test data set. Uh, so usually how we measure uh, this overfitting and underfitting is using like a validation data set. You can see uh, uh, here the y-axis measures the error of our, of our performance metric. Um, and, the, and the x-axis is the number of iteration we are training the model. Uh, so you can see as we keep training our model, our error in the training data set keeps decreasing to a very small number. But if you go to a test data set, which you did not use to train, you can see the error first decrease to some point and then it start increasing. So in this region, you are underfitting your model like what, what I showed here. And on this region, you are actually overfitting by remembering too much of the detail in the training data set and doesn't generalize well to the point out, outside your training data set. So this is what we call the overfitting. Okay, so, the, uh, so uh, there's one more thing I would like to go through is what we call the no free launch theorem. So the, low free launch, the no free launch theorem basically says averaging over all possible gen data generating process distribution. So a data, data generated distribution is just any distri probability distribution that can give you data. Uh, so every uh, classification algorithm has the same error rate when classifying previous observed data points. So the no, the no free launch theorem basically tell you that there is no such thing as Oracle machine, which perform better on every single task than every other models. Uh, so this is some something um, analogous to energy conservation. You know, energy cannot be destroyed; it cannot be created; it can just be trans transferred uh, to a certain form. So the idea of engineering is that we cannot create or destroy energy, but we can transport energy into a specific form to help us. For example, trans transferring nuclear energy to uh, electric electricity uh, to help us. You know, uh, light the light bulb. Uh, so uh, because, of, uh, because of the no free launch theorem, the core of machine learning is what we call the model engineering. So the idea is to design specific models that perform well on specific tasks instead of trying to design a model that works well on, that works well on every task. Okay, so this is uh, going to be the first section of this lecture. Uh, so uh, I use this little uh, photo I take to as kind of like a cut screen, and also I prepare a small question uh, for you to discuss. Uh, so my question for this uh, part of the lecture is, uh, how can we mitigate uh, the overfitting effect in a machine learning model? Uh, does anyone would like to try this question? 
If so, just uh, just unmute and speak up. Uh, you don't need to raise your hand or anything. Um, so if I remember well, you should add some term to the cost function, right? Then the function that you are trying to minimize, you can add another term. Okay, that's a very good answer. Yeah. That's actually yeah. one way um, to reduce overfitting, which is called regularization. So you can add a, you can add a term to your loss function, uh, and then as you optimize, this term will also kind of cancel the effect, will, 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 will disable some of the parameters for you. Uh, so uh, another another way to mitigate um, the overfitting effect is what I call um, early stopping. So the idea is that uh, when you are training your machine, you constantly monitor your performance on the data set. And when you observe that the performance does not improve for a certain period, you just say, oh, okay, now my best, no, no, I started the overfit and I will choose my best model as my best fit. So uh, I think both way works. Um, and usually you use both of them to kind of uh, guide your model to, to, find, to find the best, uh, to find the best uh, data points. Sorry, I I don't I don't understand the question. What are we gonna set in this picture? What is the goal here? Oh yeah, we we're just talking about the the underfitting and overfitting effect, right? How yeah, do you mitigate this effect? So, but in this example, I know exactly what I'm doing. We'd like to find out the trend, um, the the shape of the curve. But in that picture, what do we wanna do? Yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to ask like uh, what kind of strategy you could use to avoid overfitting. So are, are you asking about the, the the method that Edgar just talked about or the, the, the early stalking that I'm talking about? No, I don't understand the question itself. Okay. So do you understand what's underfitting and overfitting? This is easy to understand. But he's okay. not trying to fit anything in the picture. That's just a background picture. Yeah, so but what we want to do in that pic for that picture. No, this is not. Awesome. A specific... It's just a picture. Yeah, this is not a specific problem. I was just uh, trying to uh, raise a discussion about what kind of thing you could do to mitigate this effect. I think Jean refers to the picture on slide eleven. Yeah, slide eleven. And we um, maybe not, uh, maybe even earlier. So you you had a just no? go, go down a little bit. Go. Next, this one. Next. 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 Oh, this? No, just uh, yeah, this picture. Yeah, this is the background. <laughs> the picture is irrelevant here. Oh yeah, the picture is irrelevant. Yeah, it's a, it's a photo I took when I was in Japan. So I, I, I so yeah, yeah. So this is a this is <laughs> okay. used as a used as a casting. So I, I'm trying to use it as a casting for people to ask questions, and I I will also kind of bring up some of the questions that I think. Okay, sorry, I totally misunderstood it. I thought you asked us to do something. No, 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 no. <laughs> that, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. But since that, I, you know, I, I thought about the one difficult question for you. How do you know it is overfitting, right? You have like three curves, uh, well, one data set and three different curves on the slide 12. How do you actually know the overfitting one is overfitting? After all, you do not know the underlying background, uh, oh. the underlying model, sorry. Well, so again, the easiest way to know is to uh, pull out a validation data set, which we, you do not use to train. And you match. All right, of course. Oh, yes, yes. That's so yes, it very simple. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, if there is uh, no more question, uh, I will just keep going. <clears throat> Thanks for all the questions and comments. Uh, so now let's go to the second section. Uh, machine learning models. Uh, so I, I am pretty sure you have heard um, these three terms uh, very often in like newspaper or website or anything. Uh, so the first one is artificial intelligence. The second one is machine learning. And the third one is deep learning. So the relationship uh, among these three terms is actually uh, analogous to the relationship between physics, particle physics, and neutrino physics. So artificial intelligence is the broadest term that contains a, a lot of different fields. Uh, uh, for example, robotics is also considered as an artificial intelligence, but it has nothing to do with machine learning. 
So machine learning uh, usually refers to kind of uh, is a subfield of artificial intelligence, which focus on the development of a uh, learning algorithm. Uh, for example, the Boosted Decision Tree model and the Support Vector Machine model I talk about, they are both machine learning. And deep learning is a subfield of machine learning, which specifically focus on deep neural networks. So, so BDT and SVM, they are machine learning model, but they are not deep learning models. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, this uh, course, although it's called practical machine learning, I actually don't have time to go through uh, the other machine learning model, but I will actually only focus on the deep learning model, which is the most uh, prominent and fast developing. Uh, so basically we are mainly gonna just talk about deep neural networks. So machine learning model can also be categorized based on the data type. So, you know, when we train a classifier, we already, uh, we already give it uh, inputs image or waveform and we tell the machine what this uh, what this input image or waveform exactly is. Is it a cat, is it a dog, is it a person? Uh, so we have this uh, type of uh, uh, input label pairs as our training data. But sometimes you may not have label in your data set. And uh, I actually, on the, on the bottom of this plot, I draw axis where we, have, uh, where we go from a fully labeled data to fully unlabeled data. And uh, uh, based on this, uh, based on this, uh, based on whether you have a label available, uh, you will actually uh, categorize your machine learning model into different uh, categories. For example, if you have a fully labeled, fully labeled data, you can do classification and regression. If your label does not come right on time during your training, you can do something called reinforcement learning. If you have both labeled and unlabeled data, you can do something called semi-supervised learning. If you only have very little label data, you can do something called field short learning. And if you completely have no label on your data, you can do a clustering algorithm or a constructive representation learning. So all of this is going to be covered in the last module. Uh, but uh, so this is just give you a quick overview of where, what we are going to do. Uh, Could you please uh, give us an example of no yeah, actually, actually, data? Could you wait until the last module? Because I'm, I'm going to talk about each okay. of them in the last model. I, I, I'm a little bit behind, so I have to go, uh, go further. Uh, you can also uh, split machine learning model into two categories by the kind of task they are trying to solve. So the first one is computer vision, where we are trying to analyze the images or videos. And this will be covered in module two. Uh, the other one is natural language processing, where you are trying to deal with time series data and also language, like a book, like a textbook or like a lyric or something like that. So this is, uh, uh, this is going to be covered in module three and four. Okay, so now let's talk about why do we want to use a neural network to fulfill all the tasks. So first of all, neural network is very powerful. According to what, what we call the universal approximation theorem, uh, a neural network, a three layer neural network can approximate any continuous function under a mild conception, uh, under a mild uh, assumption of the activation function. And also a neural network is trainable because we propose this back propagation equation, which allow us to train very deep neural network with millions or even billions of parameters. And lastly, a neural network is a uh, highly customizable. It can be modified to easily adapt to different inputs, such as CNN for images and RNN for time series or language data. As I mentioned earlier, because of the no free launch theorem, we don't have an Oracle machine that performs well on every single model. So we will have to use a, we will have to uh, we will have to use a customizable model to kind of fit uh, the, the the feature that is uh, contained within our data. Okay, so uh, in order to introduce neural network, I would like to give you a brief history of the neural network development. So back in the 1970s, uh, there is a model called perceptual learning. So the idea is very simple. You have an input vector, uh, x1, x2, blah, blah, all the way to xn. So what you do is that you multiply a weight to each of the vector and also a weight to one. So this is just to give you the bias and the rest uh, is just to give you the, give you the fitting value. And then you, 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 you add them up together uh, using a weighted sum manner and then you feed it into a step function. So if this step function output, output a number greater than one, you say this is a signal. If the output number, well, if the, 
uh, if the output uh, give you a number of one, it means this is a signal. If the output give you a number of zero, it means it's a background. So perceptual learning is, uh, is good, but um, it's not that interesting because it's a linear classifier, which means you can only draw a straight line between two clusters of data. Uh, so it didn't really draw too much attention. But in the 1990s, uh, there is a modification to the perceptual learning. So the idea is that you convert uh, this weighted sum and step function into a nonlinear activation function. So this activation function can be anything. It can be an exponential function. It can be a, what we call a rectified linear unit, where we just keep uh, all the positive input and we set all the negative input to zero. It can be a hyperbolic tangent. So by doing this, you are actually converting a linear classifier into a nonlinear classifier. Now you can draw a curve between two clusters of data. So that's much more interesting. So the idea of neural network is that you, you have a multiple, uh, multiple neural. So, so this structure is what we call the neuron. So the idea of neural network is that you have multiple neuron in, in parallel to look at the same inputs. And that, that's what we call the layer in our neural network. And uh, so uh, the invention of the back propagation equation allows us to optimize the parameters, those Ws, uh, in, the, in the neural network layers uh, to fulfill the task we would like to do. And lastly, the idea of deep learning is just to keep adding more layers to make your neural network model more and more complicated and powerful. OK, so a neural network. So the expression of neural network, here uh, I just wrote down a two layer of neural network. Uh, what we have is just as what I described on the last slide. We have an input x. And we multiply it to a weight matrix alpha, and we add in a bias, and then we feed it to a, a nonlinear activation function. And the two-layer uh, neural network is basically I'm having this one-layer neural network, and I'm modifying to another weight beta, and I'm adding in the bias, and I feed it into another activation function, as what I described on the last slide. So alpha and beta are the what we call the weight matrices of the amp and k neuron in the neural network their value will change during the training to fulfill our need. So uh, alpha and beta is also sometimes defined as a kernel of the neural network. And you will see this word over and over again uh, throughout this lecture. So a okay. quick question. In your right figure, you have a W, 0, 1, 2, 3. Yeah. That is the same as alpha or beta. Is that right? Exactly, exactly. They are the weight. They are the weight or the kernel of the neural network, yes. So um, the configurability of a neural network is that the kernel in, in this- Where is alpha zero and the beta zero? So, so these are the bias, they are just a W zero because it's multiplied to one. So the alpha zero and the beta zero are not in this picture? Well, I mean, they are here. They are the W, W zero. So they are this value. So the W bias. zero includes alpha T and alpha zero? No, W one through N is alpha T. W zero is the W zero is alpha zero. Oh, okay. Thank you. So the configurability of a neural network is that uh, in this in this simple neural network we are multiplying the weights directly to our input, but it actually doesn't have to be that case. You can, as long as your kernel is somewhat coupled to your input, it can be called a neural network. You will see this uh, in the more complicated model that we derive. Uh, we we talk about in the future lectures. So the training of the neural network is actually performed using a gradient descent optimization progress. Uh, so for example, here, when you are trying to optimize a 2D polynomial, you can just take a derivative. Uh, and what you do is that you calculate the gradients, uh, which is in this 1D case is just a derivative. And you are moving in the opposite direction of the gradients uh, to reach, uh, to reach uh, the local or global uh, minima. So you can see uh, when, you, when you are optimizing this function, if you are at this location, uh, the, derivative is, uh, the derivative is positive, means you need to uh, move in the negative, uh, negative x direction to reach the local minima. If you are in this region, your derivative, which is the green line, is negative, meaning that you need to move in the positive x direction. And uh, so the mathematical expression of this is that uh, the, new, uh, the new points is x minus gamma times the gradients. And this gamma is what we call the learning rate uh, of the gradient descent algorithm. So most of the mainstream machine learning optimizer, for example, Adam, Adagrad, RMS prop, they are, uh, they are uh, first order optimization algorithm that only utilize the gradients. 
uh, but that sometimes doesn't give you the best result. There are also what we call the second order optimization algorithm, which utilizes the Haitian matrix to avoid a fully poorly conditioned probability space. Uh, so I'm not gonna talk about this equation in detail, but the idea that if you do a Taylor expansion as the gradient descent point, you can see that sometimes uh, besides this gradient, there is a second term that depends on the Haitian. So if this term is too large, it's actually gonna override the effect. So instead of going in the correct direction, it actually might uh, force you to go into the opposite direction. Okay, so the training of a neural network is optimizing the kernel parameters alpha and beta as we talk about with respect to the loss function. So uh, to do this, uh, it will require us to calculate the gradient on the loss function is a key step. So however, the gradient is supposed to be calculated on all input data simultaneously. So what if we have a million training data points? This is, then it will become computationally impossible because we are calculating this gradient on a million, million uh, huge matrix. Uh, so the idea of what we call the stochastic gradient descent breaks the training data set into small mini batches. Each mini batch is, a random, is randomly sampled from the training data sets and the size of the mini batch is an important hyperparameter for a neural network model. Uh, the kernel of alpha and beta is updated in a stepwise manner by sequentially feeding through each of the mini batch of the data. And this will actually reproduce the effect of training using the entire data set simultaneously. And the SGD is possible because uh, the gradient is an expectation value. Okay, so now having all the pieces in hand, uh, I would like to talk about how we are actually training the neural network. <clears throat> so the training of neural network is actually performing a two pass manner. So in the forward pass, we feed our input X into the neural network uh, with the parameter, with the kernel parameter, we talk about alpha and beta. And then this will give us a prediction, which is Y hat. And then in the backward pass, what we do is that we calculate the, we, we calculate the loss between y hat and the ground truth, um, the, the, the correct label of the data y. And then we back we use a gradient descent method uh, uh, to calculate the gradient on the kernel parameters alpha and beta. And then we updated the kernel using gradient descent. Oh, sorry. We use the back propagation equation to calculate the gradient and we use uh, gradient descent to actually update uh, the kernel parameters to fit our need. So the back propagation equation uh, basically, the idea is to treating the neural network as a very complex function. So as I de described in a few slides earlier, neural network, it, it indeed is a function. Uh, so the idea is to use a chain rule to back propagate gradient from the output layer to every single kernel in your neural network. Uh, so this, uh, this equation could look a little bit scary, uh, but I'm not gonna go through a lot of the details. So here is a neural network I defined about two layers ago. And you define two parameters called S and delta as the error of your first layer, which is S, and the error of your second layer, which is delta. And the error of second layer, since it got fed into the loss function, it can be also be directly computed from the loss function. And the back propagation equation uh, looks a little bit scary, but actually it links delta to X, that S. That means you can use your error on the second layer to calculate the error on the first layer. And then the gradient will be obtained by this equation. So this is how back propagation equation works. It's pretty much um, under the spirit of a chain rule. You should never be. You should never need to calculate BP equation by hand. Uh, the good news is. Uh, so uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow, as you might have already heard of, are their official name are what we call the automatic differentiation framework, which calculates the BP uh, the BP gradient automatically. So they, those, those uh, framework will take care of it. So in PyTorch, neural network is a complicated ensemble of mathematical operations. And what it does is that it builds a neural network as a computational graph, as I showed on the right. And then it do the forward pass uh, to calculate the y hat, and then it do the backward pass to calculate the gradient and update gradients. So you can see this uh, mathematical operation can be break into different nodes, for example, uh, a times uh, W1 and also A times W2. And then you add them together and you multiply W3 and W4. And then you go to the, uh, you go to the, um, you would go to the loss function. And then from the loss function, you can back propagate. Uh, and uh, basically each, uh, 
each um, edge of this graph represent a derivative uh, a derivative expression. So to calculate, uh, so here we define the problem uh, in this uh, computational graph. And we, in the backward path, we are just tracing on the edge to figure out what the correct gradient to use. For example, if we are trying to calculate the gradient of the loss with respect to this parameter W2, we just go along the edge, we do dl dd times dd dc times dc dw2, and that's going to give us uh, give us a gradient. So we will practice this in the lecture one homework. <clears throat> okay, uh, cool. So uh, this is actually the second module, and we have one more left. Uh, so now uh, let's do like a uh, again, let's do like a one minute break, and I also prepare a, a question for you. If a three layer fully connected neural network can already fit one arbitrary function, any continuous function, why do we need a deep or a complicated uh, neural network model? Does anyone want to try this? Well, it is because the number of nodes can become very large if you have uh, only a few layers. Okay, great. That's, um, that's exactly the right answer, yes. So uh, uh, the, the universal approximation theorem tells you that a neural network, a three layer neural network is enough, but you don't know how many layers you need in the intermediate hidden layer. You need like a billion nodes or even 10 to the 26 nodes. And it's basically impossible uh, for such a neural network to fit um, on your GPU or computer. Uh, that's why we want- say nodes, do you mean individual- uh... Neurons, yeah. Neurons? Okay. Wenchen, do you have a question? Yes, about that. So on each layer of a neural network, the number of nodes is just in the dimension of the width without the bias. Is that correct? Yes, yes, you can consider it that way. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, all right. Thanks. In your previous slide, where is the bias? Where is the A0? Oh, this is not a neural network. This is just a computational graph for this calculation. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, yeah, I mean, a neural network is, uh, is, is not this. This is just a simple calculation, yeah. And we'll practice. I found uh, many um, graphs in neural network and languages are simplified. Sometimes some terms are combined together. So it's, you know, sometimes it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. You may need to, uh, um, look at the more uh, pictures online to see the exact correspondence. Sometimes I, I just find that some of them are uh, simplified. You know, yeah, yeah, exactly. my... uh, This is a this is a very simple, uh, very simple computational graph. That's why I'm doing it in the homework. If it's a complicated, then it's uh, going to be hard to actually do it in the homework. Uh, sorry, I have to keep going. I I didn't expect the time is uh, flowing so fast. So. Let's go to the last module of today, which is the loss function of the neural network. So here I will talk about uh, regression loss, classification loss, and also some kind of a combined loss for more uh, complicated purpose. So regression loss is pretty easy. Uh, so we have the L1 loss, which is basically the absolute distance between two points. So L1 loss is generally more robust and it also, but the downside is that is not everywhere differentiable. For example, if you look at the L1 loss at zero, it's not differentiable because it's a, it's a, sharp, it's a sharp edge. Uh, so that's why sometimes people use what we call the smooth L1 loss, where when the, uh, re when the region of L1 is below, certain, uh, is below certain value, you replace it with the MSE loss. So that's why you kind of smooth out uh, this uh, non-differentiable point and while still preserving the very nice, robust nature of L1 loss. So the other one, uh, so the other loss is L2 loss or uh, the mean square error loss. So this is, uh, this is most commonly used and is basically and the advantage is that is everywhere differentiable. And, but uh, as you can see, uh, the loss gets very large if you move a, a bit away from the optimal value. And that will actually bring us uh, some problem called gradient explosion when we are training our neural network. Uh, so the second loss I would like to talk about is the cross entropy loss. So in order to talk about that, I will have to give you a little bit of touch on the information theory. So let's start from the famous Boltzmann entropy. It's written as uh, entropy equal to Boltzmann constant times log times this uh, parameter W, 
So when I first learned statistical mechanics, I was very confused about this W. Uh, people tell me this is the number of real microstates correspond to gas macrostate. So, so this is confusing to me as an undergrad, as a second year undergrad. Uh, but I guess uh, now I already understand it. Uh, and information entropy is actually somewhat equivalent to the Boltzmann entropy. So, is, uh, so we have this, uh, we also have this log term and in the log term, we have this uh, one divided by the probability PI. So the probability PI is a number of, uh, is a, so this one divided by PI can be considered as the number of states in state I, assuming all states have equal probability. So for example, if something happens at a 20% chance, then one divided by that means you have five uh, equal partition. Uh, of that state, uh, if they all have the same probability. Uh, so this thing is also sometimes called optimal coding length in information theory, but I'm not going to go through what that is because it's kind of irrelevant to our purpose. So the entropy, the information entropy we are talking about is basically taking a, uh, is basically taking an expectation value on this uh, term log, uh, uh, log number of state. So a Boltzmann entropy, uh, so so let, now let's define something called a binary entropy where we only have two states. Uh, one happens with probability P and the other one happens, of course, with the probability one minus P. So this is how it looks like. It's just, uh, I'm just rewriting that equation using a two state form where we have P log one over P minus one minus P log one over one minus P. So this, is, this can be considered as a coin tossing problem. Suppose we are tossing a fair coin that is the probability of the coin landing at head and the coin landing at tail are equal. Uh, so if you if you evaluate the entropy of that system, you will just get uh, this uh, entropy equal to log two, which is uh, 0.46931. Uh, so uh, suppose now we have a different coin where it is unfair. So when we toss it, it's more likely to head, uh, to land in the head than landing the tail. So let's say the probability of landing in the head is 0.8. Then if you calculate the binary cross entropy, the binary entropy on that coin, you will actually get 0.5. So you can see this entropy is actually lower than the, the fair coin entropy. So, the, uh, so uh, this is because information entropy is the average amount of surprise we measure when we toss a coin. When we toss a fair coin, it's really hard to predict whether the next outcome is a head or a tail. So the average surprise is actually high, and thus it has a high entropy, as you can see on this plot. Uh, so the x axis is the probability of landing a head for a coin, and the y axis is the a, is a average information entropy of this process. And for unfair coin, for example, if the probability of getting a head is 80%, then I would very, so when I predict this outcome, I would very likely to predict that it is a head. So the average surprise will be low, and thus we will have a low entropy on that system. Okay, so the next concept I would like to talk about is a cross entropy. So cross entropy is calculated uh, over two probability distributions, P and Q. Suppose we have a classification task to separate zero new signal from some kind of background, single multi-side alpha uh, or some other business working. So then let's label all our signal with the number one and our background with a uh, with, with the number zero. So the ground truth distribution P will follow the distribution of our label. Let's say we, we simulate all this event using Monte Carlo simulation so we know exactly what it is. Uh, on the other hand, we will build a neural network which analyze every single event to produce the output score between zero and one. The output score will follow some kind of probability distribution uh, QX. The train of neural network is to fit QX to the best, uh, to best approximate PS. So that means if an event is a signal zero new double beta events, it's gonna output a number that's closer to one. If the signal, uh, if the event is a background event, it's gonna output a number closer to zero. And this is actually achieved by what we call the binary cross entropy loss which is HPQ, and this is the same as a, where we are just uh, placing the uh, placing the, prob the truth probability distribution here, and also the probability distribution obtained by the neural network here. So the neural, you can actually consider this neural network classifier 
as kind of a information answer, information like a information theory perspective. So remember, information entropy measures the average surprise, amount of surprise uh, from the neural network outcome, outcome QX. So cross entropy measures the average amount of surprise from distribution QX produced by the neural network given the ground truth distribution PX of the label. So minimize cross entropy is identical to minimizing the surprise of the neural network output with respect to the ground truth label of detected events. So when the event is zero, uh, when the when the when the event is a zero new double beta, then uh, the neural network output should give you a number closer to one. And when the event is not a zero new double beta, the neural network should give you a number closer to zero. So because of this, a lower cross entropy loss means a better separation between signal and background. Actually, you will see this again in the lecture one homeworks. Lastly, uh, in certain cases, you will need to simultaneously op optimize more than one losses. For example, in the, in the GAN, in, uh, generative adversarial neural network, you want to optimize generator loss and discriminator loss uh, together. And also in the regional CNN, which we will talk about in the next lecture, uh, we will need to optimize the classification loss plus the regression loss simultaneously. Uh, so uh, there is one, of, uh, one, one paper which proposed a way to optimize multiple loss. And I just list the equation here. I think this will be useful if you were to design a more complicated machine learning model. And theta one and theta two are extracted from the neural network. So they are actually changing during the training. Okay, so this is, uh, this is everything I would like to cover in the first lecture. I will just quickly go through the summary. So we talk about uh, what is machine learning and we also discuss the three pillars of machine learning model, which is the task, the experience and the performance. And we discuss the relationship between artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning and how to train a neural network. And we also talk about regression loss, classification loss, and the combined loss. The next lecture, we will talk about how a machine learning model will deal with image data using a convolutional neural network. Uh, OK, so I have three minutes uh, So to take any question. How do you initialize your neural network weight, weight matrix? OK, that's a good question. So there are different ways uh, to initialize it. Usually what I do is just, I just insert some random number in certain range. Uh, so the initialization actually, uh, so I, I think the initialization sometimes uh, will change your results, but because of the way that the neural network uh, optimizer is designed, usually is not that important. Yeah. As your long as you randomize layer, it. Yeah. yeah. Your second layer is, depends on the sum of the first layer result. Yes. Uh, so is it possible that you can get like infinity in the second layer when you sum up everything from the first layer? Well, but I mean, the first layer also contains this kernel, which, which is value changes during the training process, right? So they are like a dynamic system where they work together to fulfill, to fulfill your task. It's a linear function, so no infinite. Well, yes, it's a linear function. You add everything together. Let's say you have uh, 10,000, uh, uh, neurons in the first layer, uh, you add them all up together to be the one input for the for the one of the neurons in the second layer. And that input can be infinity because you add everything up from the first layer. Well, I mean, uh, then to, to address that, you can use the activation function, right? For example, you feed your value into a hyperbolic tangent, then your output can just be between zero and one. So it's never gonna explode. I think what you are talking about, Jin, is, a, is, a, is what we call a gradient explosion, where one of the gradients is too large that it turns one of the parameters in your neural network to pretty much infinity, and that's gonna give you a, not a number loss. So that's just one of the problems you will need to deal with when you are training your neural, net, neural network. Thank you. I appreciate your effort to make uh, so many slides. And um, um, for me as a, as a newcomer, um, I need more time to digest individual slides. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I just want to mention that I will upload the video and this slide and also some reference reading material on the course website. Uh, so if you feel like uh, some of the content is confusing or you need more time to uh, stare at it and digest, uh, please feel free to uh, check it out. It should be available um, later today, I think. Yeah. Thank you.
Okay, is there any other question? I have a question on slide yes. 12. Slide 12. Yes. Um, uh, sorry, how I can mean... how to share again. Sorry. Uh, or I could ask it verbally, it's okay. Um, you showed a loss function plot uh, where we could see that the training curve and the um, training set and the um, validation set are deviating. Um, yeah. So is this the only way we could find whether the uh, model is overtraining or is there any other way uh, we could do it? Uh, find it? Let me think. Uh, so I, I think, I mean, this, this is the only way I, I know. Do you have any specific uh, like way in your mind that you would like to uh, you would like to iterate and I can, I can maybe kind of judge if that's possible? Um, no, this is the only one that I know of. So I was just curious to know whether is there any other way to know the overfitting in a network um, other than plotting the loss function and seeing um, this. Well, yeah, I, I mean, uh, the term of overfitting. So overfitting is not like a physics phenomenon. Uh, it's more like it's gonna affect your model performance. It's like it's like a it's, it's, it's like something that will affect your model performance. So so it depends on like how well you want your model to uh, to work, right? For example, if you are building a neural network classifier to classify like zero new double beta from some other kind of physics, then you can say, oh, I am your model is like maybe thirty percent of the time correct, and that is probably because you can only do that to that extent. Or it can because your model is overfitting. It can do fifty percent, but it only do thirty percent because of overfitting. So in that case, you can actually improve its performance by dealing with overfitting. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this okay. is only oh, one. Yes. Uh, Wen Chen, I see you raise your hand. Do you have any questions? Right. On this topic again, uh, does the loss function have anything to do with underfitting, overfitting? Is it sensitive? Uh, probably not. The so loss function is just a is just a metric. It's just a mathematical expression where you evaluate the where you evaluate the uh, the performance of your neural network. Uh, so the overfitting comes with the fact that your neural network has too many parameters, and those parameters are just too powerful for the actual task we are trying to solve. So usually, when we deal with overfitting, we are uh, we are we are touching we are touching the the neural network. For example, inserting like a dropout layer or something. But as okay. Edgar mentioned earlier, you there is a way to insert additional terms in your um, loss function to reduce the effect of overfitting, and that's some something we already call the regularization. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I I, I thought that there must be some dependence because if I used the, the wrong category of uh, loss function, I used the classification um, uh, for uh, regression, then Probably that I mean okay. So, so if I used the wrong category of loss function, I used the regression loss function in a place where I should use classification. What will be the consequence? That what would be the sign for that? Okay, I think I think if that's the case, then that usually calls underfitting, not overfitting, because you are, for example, if you are using regression loss in a classification problem. Uh, so in, in regression, basically, what you are what you care about is that. Uh, so for example, when you perform a classification, you are just having a, a vector of machine learning output and you select the, the largest output as your classi classification decision. Uh, and in that case, you don't actually care about all other outputs. So, uh, but if you are using a regression loss, then regression loss actually try to simultaneously minimize the distance between not only the classification decision, but also other classes. So that will, uh, drain a lot of the power of the neural network toward the trivial part of the decision. So that's okay. why I'm gonna actually underfit instead of overfit. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, there are any other questions? Okay, um, yeah. Hi. Um I have just like a basic question. So like if if we See that if you observe that the loss uh, loss curve is like fluctuating, what does that uh, will tell us? So sorry. If, it had like, if, if the loss uh, loss curve has like fluctuations in it, then like what will the 
Oh, I think I think the fluctuation. Well, I mean, no real model will produce uh, such a nice curve. I think the fluctuation is normal. It's just uh, it's just a statistical fluctuation uh, of of your neural network. That's why when you do uh, what what I what I call the early stopping, you usually wait for a certain period before you say, "Oh, this is my best point," instead of just reaching the lowest and then claiming that this is a, this is my best best performance. Uh, yeah. So the fluctuation is just a statistical effect when you are training. We are training for that. Yeah, it's, it's not a big problem. Okay, cool. Thanks. Okay, great. Any other questions? Okay, if not, uh, thanks for attending the practical machine learning lecture. I hope you all enjoyed it. And uh, again, the material will be updated, uh, will be uploaded to the website. And uh, we will do the next module the same time next week. So I will talk to all of you then. Have a good weekend. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. See you. Thanks. All right. Hi, uh, Oli. So you said that you will give the training code are you giving us today. Oh uh, yeah, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna send it to you in the in the chat. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So do you get it? Uh, let me see. Oh yeah, I got that. <laughs>